Hey everyone, and welcome to an online lecture on geologic time. This is chapter 11 for my earth science class. The geologic time scale is a, a really important part of all sciences and has been part, uh, it's been very important uh, over the past hundred, couple hundred years, scientists have been wondering how old the earth is and all the different events that have occurred uh, in Earth history and how we can put that all in order. So it's been a very important goal in science and specifically in geology. And think of rocks that you find outcropped all around Earth as kind of pages in a book, a history book, and this is the history of Earth, okay? Um, and within those rocks, they tell us information about past geologic events, depositional environments, and they even ha hold uh, evidence of past life. So it kind of tracks uh, the evolution of life through geologic time. And for a long time, scientists had no clue how old the Earth was or how long ago these geologic events occurred or uh, when these organisms or how long ago these uh, organisms that may now be extinct, how long ago those things occurred. So um, the, the numerical time perspective on these events have very little meaning, um, but with modern techniques, we're able to discern what we refer to as numerical dates. And uh, numerical dates uh, really just tell us the specific number of years that have passed since an event has occurred. So it could be a volcanic eruption, it could be an asteroid impact, something like that. Um, and we're able to, today, with today's technology, um, able to determine numerical dates for specific rock units. So the example given here is uh, this limestone is 250 million years old. Okay, that's a specific numerical date. Okay, um, it really was the, the discovery of radioactivity which allowed scientists to date with reliability the events uh, in geologic past. Prior to that, what geologists did was uh, they used relative dates. And relative dates are essentially just putting um, events or uh, rocks in order of sequence of formation. So the example here is the Hermit Shale uh, is older than the Coconino Sandstone, okay? Which means that, yeah, this the Hermit Shale is what was deposited first, and then on top of that, the Coconino Sandstone was deposited on that. And, and these principles that were developed, you know, over 400 years ago, they're still accurate today. The principle of superposition is one of those. And what the principle of superposition states is essentially that if you have an outcrop of sedimentary rocks, um, the sedimentary rock that's on the bottom is the oldest, and the sedimentary rocks that are laid on top of it get progressively younger. Okay, this also applies to uh, modern occurrences like lava flows. Like let's pretend you have a lava flow that flows one day, let's say in your, you're in Hawaii and Kilauea erupts and there's a lava flow that goes through your backyard, right? Um, and then the following day or the following week, another lava flow comes through the back of your yard and flows on top of the previous flow. You can determine uh, quite logically that the first lava flow on the bottom is older than the lava flow above it. And that was developed by Nicholas Steno in 1669. Okay, so here the example is uh, you're at the Grand Canyon, right? You're standing at a ledge here. Uh, these rocks are the youngest. You're at the top here looking over the Grand Canyon. These are the youngest rocks on top. And as you uh, go down the sedimentary column, they get progressively older. So you have the oldest rocks at the bottom and the youngest rocks on top. The next principle is the principle of original horizontality. And this essentially just states that, that layers of sediment are deposited normally uh, in a horizontal position. So if you encounter an outcrop of sedimentary rocks that, um, that are not uh, flat or horizontal or have been disturbed, that occurred after deposition, okay? So those rock layers were deformed from their previously horizontal position to their new position. And you can see that here. Look at these sedimentary rocks. These are all kind of scrunched up together, a couple of pairs of anticlines and synclines. And, and what you can determine here 
is essentially that these sedimentary rocks were once uh, laid down horizontally and then uh, geologic forces or tectonic forces kind of uh, crumpled them up and that deformation occurred after deposition. The next principle is the principle of lateral continuity and here sedimentary layers originate as kind of continuous layers that extend in all directions in a depositional environment. And what, what happens is those environments uh, slowly change into new environments. So what that means is that the sediment kind of uh, thins out or grades into a different type of sediment. Okay. And so when we have modern features like rivers that cut through a landscape and they erode away a lot of uh, sedimentary rocks, um, if you look across a canyon, you can assume that the sedimentary rocks beneath you uh, will be the same sedimentary rocks that you'd see on the other side of the canyon. Okay. So let's take, uh, let's go to the uh, Grand Canyon as an example. Here, this, this used to be a depositional environment at the ocean. And you can see here, uh, sedimentary rocks are being laid down in a shallow ocean. Okay. Then as the Colorado Plateau was uplifted, the Colorado River kind of cut down into this area and eroded all these rocks. Okay. So if you're standing on one side of the canyon and you overlook to the other side of the canyon, um, you can assume that you'll run into the same rocks on either side of the canyon. All right? That's the principle of lateral continuity, that you'll find a sandstone that you're standing on over here. You'll see it on the other side of the canyon. And that's true. If you look at this, this uh, Coconino sandstone is a distinctly white sandstone that has a lot of quartz in it. And you can see it way across the canyon, all over in these areas. Another distinguishable unit in the Grand Canyon is the Redwall Limestone. And you can see the Redwall Limestone all over the canyon. All right, because it's laterally continuous. Another example of lateral continuity is when you have a fault. So here we have a fault kind of cutting through all of these uh, horizontally layered sedimentary rocks. Okay. And in this situation, this uh, distinctly white layer here was once laterally continuous with the same layer over here. You can tell uh, that there's been some displacement. So this uh, block of rock has moved in this direction and this one has moved in that direction. So this was once connected, they were once laterally continuous. All right, the next principle is the principle of cross cutting. And here, young features cut across older features. Kind of makes sense, it's kind of like, um, Let's pretend uh, there's a snowfall, right? And there's snow that's covering the ground and then someone walks on top of the snow, they leave footprints behind. You can assume that uh, the snow fell first and then the, the, the footprints kind of cut across the snow. Someone walked on the snow after the snow fell. Uh, and so that's how you can tell the age relationship there. Okay, so uh, if we go back to the same image of the fault, Okay, this unit here, this white unit, is older than the fault itself because it had to have been here for the fault to move it, right? So the fault is younger, this fault right here is younger than uh, these units right here, right? Because the units had to have been there for the fault to move them, okay? So essentially the fault is cross-cutting through these units. The same holds true with intrusions. These are basaltic dikes right here, this dark layer of rock, and this is uh, a volcanic rock that cut through uh, the country rock right here. Um, and so this country rock had to have been here for the intrusion to kind of cut through them. So therefore, the dikes are younger than the country rock. Okay, so that's the principle of cross cutting. The principle of occlusions um, essentially just states that if you have fragments of one rock that are enclosed in another, the rock that contains the inclusion is younger. So when you have a, a, an intruding body, uh, sometimes that, it, that body can rip up pieces of the country rock and incorporate them into the magma. We call those xenoliths. Okay, let's go to an example here. Here we have an igneous intrusion, okay, this huge thing over here, and it intruded into the existing rock here, and it ripped up pieces of this, we'll call this a metamorphic rock here. Okay, so the metamorphic rock uh, had to have been there for this to occur, all right? So the igneous intrusion ripped up these pieces of the uh, metamorphic rock and in incorporated it into the intrusion, okay? So these are those inclusions, okay? So therefore, 
the igneous intrusion is younger than this metamorphic rock. Okay. Wow, it's hard to spell here. That's uh, that's meta for metamorphic. Okay, dot dot dot. Okay, then if you look at these sedimentary layers here, um, or because of the the principle of superposition, this is the oldest sedimentary layer. Then this is the next youngest, and up here is the youngest sedimentary layer. Okay. Um, what we can see is that there are inclusions of the igneous intrusion here, and there are inclusions of the metamorphic rock here. So this indicates that this purple sedimentary layer um, is younger than the igneous intrusion and the metamorphic intrusion. So if you were to kind of label these rock units from oldest to youngest, you would say this right here, the metamorphic rock is the oldest, number one. Then the igneous intrusion came in, that's two. Right, and then this purple layer is three, this is four, and that's five. Wow, that's a big mess. <laughs> okay, so that's the principle of inclusions. All right, so let's talk about unconformities. If we go back to the idea that uh, rock layers are kind of like a like pages in a book, ge a history book, a geologic history of the Earth, unconformities are. Um, parts of the book that are missing, essentially like pages of the book that have been ripped away. Um, and the reason this occurs is because there isn't always deposition. Um, sometimes there can be erosion or non-deposition. What that represents is like a, a hiatus in time when nothing's being recorded, so to speak. Okay, so let's pretend we're in a depositional environment and layers of rock are being deposited and there's no interruption, right? This typically happens in the ocean. All of those sedimentary layers are considered conformable. Okay, but circumstances change. Uh, plate tectonics occurs and areas get uplifted. And when they do, there's erosion. And what erosion essentially is, is taking an eraser and erasing geologic history. You're basically removing or weathering and eroding the existing rock, and that's essentially a loss of history. So that occurs when you have uplift and erosion. Okay. Um, and so there's three types of unconformities. There's angular, uh, there's nonconformity, and there's also a disconformity. Okay, so let's take this situation here. Here we have a depositional environment, and we have layers one, two, three, four, five being uh, deposited, one being the oldest, five being the youngest. All right, it's a nice depositional environment. Um, you know, maybe there are fossils of unique organisms in layer number five that are in here. It'll tell us a lot of information uh, about what the environment was like, what kind of organisms lived here. Okay, but the geologic circumstances change, and this whole area is uplifted, and these layers are deformed. And so now they're exposed at the Earth's surface. Glaciers, rivers, all these, uh, all this geologic phenomena will erode these rocks away, and essentially it erases geologic history. And so if we go through time, right, and as this erosional process occurs, as you can see, layer five is almost completely eroded away. So all those fossils that we once had that were here have eroded away, and that, you know, it might have been some sort of unique organism that we didn't know about. It's gone forever. We don't know anything about it. So now this is exposed at the Earth's surface, Weathering takes place, erosion, um, but let's say sea level rises and this area becomes a depositional environment again. Then we can have renewed deposition of horizontal sedimentary layers. Okay. And so what an angular unconformity is, is this contact, this black contact right here. Okay. Um, it basically states that these layers underneath are angled and they do not conform with the horizontal layers above it and then there's an erosional surface in between them. And what that indicates is that there was a period in time, this period in time, when there was no deposition and there was actually erosion. And so it essentially shows up as like missing time in geologic history for this specific area. So here we see um, the book shows us an example of near vertical units. These are sandstones and shales interbedded and they're near vertical, okay? And these units do not conform with the angled units over here. These are conglomerates and sandstones. So see how there's a difference in angle? That means that this erosional surface here 
represents a hiatus in time when there was no deposition and there was actually erosion. Okay, so that's in Scotland. All right, the other type of unconformities are uh, a disconformity and a nonconformity. Okay, a disconformity, let me go to the picture. Essentially, you have uh, sedimentary layers above uh, and below the erosional surface. Okay, so here's a, a limestone over here, and here's a sandstone. Um, but what you notice in between them is, is there's a, um, an erosional surface, and this surface here is the disconformity. What that represents is, let's say this was a sandstone, was being deposited in sort of like a shallow marine setting. That was occurring, and then maybe sea level fell. And as sea level fell, um, it started to erode a lot of the sandstone. Okay, maybe there were some units above that sandstone. Maybe there was like some gypsum or other limestone or, or uh, shale or something, but we don't know because that, uh, you know, that's all eroded away because it, this, these units were exposed at the Earth's surface. But then let's say over geologic time, sea level rises again, okay, and this area becomes a depositional setting, becomes a shallow marine setting, and now we have deposition of limestone here, okay. So what a disconformity just essentially means is uh, a gap in time when there was no uh, erosion. And then there are sedimentary layers above and below the erosional surface. A nonconformity, uh, as you can see here, is this erosional surface. And what a nonconformity is, is the rocks above and below don't conform with one another. Okay, meaning that like this is an, a, an igneous rock. Okay, this is a metamorphic rock. All right. And the contact between the metamorphic igneous rock with the sedimentary rock, um, they don't conform with one another. So again, this means that there was uh, a period in time where there was no deposition and there was erosion. Okay, so there's missing geologic time in this unit over here. So that's a non-conformity. Okay, and if we go to the Grand Canyon, you can see all three of these unconformities. And the Grand Canyon is impressive. Okay, some of the rocks down here, are the oldest rocks, the Vishnu Schist is about 1.8 billion years old. Whoops, okay. Billion years old. <laughs> okay, and the rocks up here, um, the Kaibab limestone is about 250 million years old. Okay. So the Grand Canyon represents about a billion years of geologic history, which is really amazing. And in the Grand Canyon, all three unconformities can be found. A nonconformity can be found near the gorge. Here's the Colorado River. Okay, this right here is a nonconformity. All right, this is that contact. It's the contact between the Vishnu Schist, okay, and these kind of horizontal Tanto group rocks here, and also the contact between the Zoroaster granite and Vishnu Schist with the uh, tilted Unkar group rocks over here. Okay, then above that over here, this contact. This is an angular unconformity, okay? So the Unkar group rocks over here are tilted, which means they were deformed in some point in the geologic history. And these angled rocks do not conform with the horizontal rocks above them. And you can see that here, see that in that picture? See this gently angled rocks over here and then they come in contact with these horizontal rocks? That's an angular unconformity, okay? And then over here, uh, where we see the red wall limestone, the red wall limestone is bounded by two disconformities, one above and one below. Okay. Um, and really what it represents is, uh, here we have the Moab limestone, and when it was deposited, it was deposited in a kind of a shallow transitional sea. Um, but at some point, either sea level fell um, and exposed the Moab limestone. Maybe the Moab limestone was like a thousand feet thicker Okay, but we'll never know because that stuff eroded away because it was exposed at the Earth's surface. Um, and then sea level uh, rose and then we had the deposition of the Redwall limestone and that left behind erosional surface and that's a disconformity. And so you see that below the Redwall limestone and also above it. Okay, so the Redwall limestone uh, may have been thicker, much thicker. Maybe there were other units deposited on top of the Redwall limestone that have since eroded away. Um, we don't know that. Okay, so it's just a, this rep, these two points here represent uh, gaps in time uh, in, in geologic history. All right, so those are unconformities. Okay, so what geologists a lot of times have to do 
is look at cross sections of rocks and really kind of become a detective and determine uh, what's happened um, to these rocks over geologic time and come up with like a relative order or a sequence of events that uh, created this situation. And you may have to do this for uh, your upcoming exam, but uh, the way to decipher what you see here is to start off over here in step one, okay? So over here, we have a depositional setting. Uh, we have the deposition of A, B, C, and E, A being the oldest, E being the youngest, okay? Um, and then we see an intrusion, D, and we know, despite the fact that D is underneath E, um, D is younger, because if you look closely, you can see the inclusions. See those little inclusions? That indicates that E is older than D because of the principle of inclusions, okay? Um, and then here, uh, Dyke F kind of cuts through all of these, so that's the principle of cross-cutting, so F is younger than all of these units here. Um, and then these rocks were deformed or tilted. Then there was renewed deposition of all these horizontal layers. So if I were to ask you to list uh, these units from oldest to youngest, I would go from oldest A, B, C, E, D, F, deformational event, tilting all these layers, uh, and then erosion, here's the angular unconformity, and then layers G, H, I, J, K. Okay, and that's how you would determine the relative ages of all the rock units and geologic events. Okay, the other kind of really important part of geologic time is what we find in the rock units, typically sedimentary rocks, but what we find are a lot of times are fossils. Fossils are really important because they're um, traces or the actual remains of things that lived on Earth in geologic past. Okay, and the science that studies uh, fossils is paleontology, okay? And what's useful about knowing what kind of organisms existed uh, in the past is that they help us understand what the environmental conditions were like in the past. So if we see uh, a lot of um, ocean organisms that uh, could only have lived in warm tropical waters, well then we can assume during the time of the formation of, that, of those sedimentary rocks, it must have been warm, right? Um, in addition to that, uh, you can find fossils worldwide. And if you find fossils in the Grand Canyon of a particular organ organism, and you go to Australia and you find the same organism in a rock outcrop there, you can correlate those rocks. Uh, they must have occurred at a similar time because they contain uh, similar organisms. So correlation amongst rocks on different parts of Earth is really useful. Uh, when it comes uh, down to, to looking at the fossils that are found in them. So there are a bunch of different types of fossils. Permineralization essentially is, is when you uh, petrify something or turn it to stone. Um, so groundwater will move through the pores of an organic organism and replace the carbon with, with typically it's, it's uh, silica and that's what usually is preserved. But uh, mineral rich groundwater a lot of times filled with silica, um, goes through those pores, uh, and so you, you either find bone or wood, um, and then precipitates that material. So, uh, for example, um, there's a, a national park in Arizona called the, Petri the, the Petrified Wood Forest, and you can see a bunch of ancient trees that have been preserved um, as, uh, in, essentially as stone. Okay, so that's permineralization. Molds and casts are essentially when an organism dies uh, and is buried in sediment, um, <clears throat> its shell will fill with sediment and then uh, dissolves under, under, uh, underground, uh, under the water. And then um, when, when you crack open uh, that fossil, it reveals um, like uh, the exterior of the organism and also the interior. So there's a mold and a cast and that's created uh, by sediment filling up the hollow spaces and by the exterior of the organism kind of creating uh, uh, a mold of itself in the sediment. I have pictures in a second. Um, amber, you can, you know, cue that Jurassic Park music, okay? That's the hardened resin of ancient trees. So when insects, uh, you know, latch on the trees and sap happens to be running down that, 
that tree, they can get trapped in that and preserved, okay? Um, <clears throat> impressions essentially are um, organisms that die in like, a sh like shale or mud or silt, and they leave behind impressions of their body, okay? Um, those are particularly useful for organisms that don't have hard parts, okay? Um, yeah, that's really good for, and also leaves, like plants, okay? Um, carbonization, uh, that's when uh, an organism is compressed and it squeezes out all the gases and liquids and leaves a really thin film of carbon. Um, and a lot of times, that's, uh, those are the uh, fossils of insects that we'll have. Okay, let me go to the pictures. All right, so here's your petrified wood. Okay, so that's really made of silicon stone. It's really strong. Here's your mold and cast. This is a trilobite, an organism that lived uh, over 540 million years ago. It's really small. It's a couple centimeters in length. They lived all over the oceans. Here's a, a, a carbonization. Okay, here's an insect that's preserved. Okay, um, here's an imprint. Okay, so fish and their cartilage can be preserved as imprints and shales and uh, siltstones. This is amber right here. Okay, so we've got a gross spider entrapped or entombed in amber. And then there are trace fossils. Trace fossils are just um, indirect evidence of life. So they could be like footprints of organisms, reptile, reptile tracks. Um, they can also be uh, fossil dung. Okay, there are scientists that study excrement of ancient organisms. Okay, so those are considered trace fossils. All right, so <clears throat> fossils uh, really, the ones that we find, or the ones that we found, don't represent all the organisms that existed on Earth, okay? Our fossil record is heavily biased, and it's heavily biased towards organisms that possess hard parts, okay? Because they are more likely to be preserved, okay? And organisms that live in environments that, uh, that can have rapid burial uh, also increase the chances of being preserved. Okay, so typically that means organisms that live in the ocean. All right, organisms that live in the ocean, we have a lot of fossils on, and so we have a good idea of what type of organisms uh, that lived in the ocean in geologic past that also contained hard parts. But if you think of an organism like a jellyfish, right, that doesn't contain any hard parts, they're not going to be preserved in the fossil record because of that. And so we really have no clue as to uh, all the different types of species of jellyfish that could have existed. Um, and that goes with any other organism that doesn't possess hard parts, okay? I like to use the example of, uh, there's a white-tailed deer uh, that live in one island uh, in the Florida Keys, like Isla Morada. It's a miniature deer that lives on that little island. You find it nowhere else in the world. Okay, that organism existed. It's around today. But if it ever goes extinct, um, you, it's really going to be very difficult for that to be preserved in the fossil record. One, because it's not um, kind of geographically everywhere and also doesn't live in an environment uh, that's, you know, where it could be easily preserved. So our understanding of life in Earth's past is missing a lot of information or it's heavily biased towards organisms that have hard parts, okay? All right, correlation is essentially matching rocks from different parts of the Earth um, so that it can kind of give us a better idea of what the environment was like across different places in Earth and the different organisms that, list, that lived in those different rock layers. It allows us to compare units from different environments, which is very useful, okay? Um, in, in the U.S., we're really lucky. We have three great national parks, like the Grand Canyon, Zion, and Bryce, and these areas record a lot of geologic history. We talked about the Grand Canyon already, and the Grand Canyon spans um, about a billion years of geologic history, from the Precambrian all the way to the Triassic. Okay, one billion years. Um, and we can correlate the Grand Canyon to the canyon at Zion Park, Zion National Park. So here's the Grand Canyon, right? Here's that big canyon of rocks. Those rocks are laterally continuous all the way up the Colorado Plateau to higher elevations over here at Zion. 
And in fact, the Kaibab limestone that you find in the Grand Canyon is also present here at Zion. It's one of the youngest rocks at Zion. So you can make a direct correlation between the rocks at Zion and the rocks at the Grand Canyon. So essentially what Zion Canyon does is it preserves younger rocks. So it takes you from the Permian all the way to the Jurassic. Okay, right, Jurassic. All right, and what's really cool is if you go even up higher into different ele higher elevations on the Colorado Plateau, there are even younger rocks that are preserved here. And you can find them at Bryce National Park. And the kind of the largest unit here at Zion, the Navajo Sandstone, you also find the Navajo Sandstone at Bryce. So these can be directly correlated. And so what that gives us um, is another piece in geologic time that uh, all these younger rocks are exposed. So it takes us from the uh, beginning of the Jurassic all the way to the Paleogene or into the Cenozoic. Okay, so this correlation from these three outcrops provides us uh, more geologic history, which is very useful. And that's not the case uh, everywhere in the U.S. These places are, you know, here's the triangle of the, of the three parks that provides us a lot of geologic history of the West Coast of the United States, which is very useful. Um, in other places in the world, what they have to do is correlate the rocks uh, via fossils, okay? And the way they can do that is the ideal of final succession. Okay, this was developed by William Smith. He was a British canal builder, not the star of uh, Bad Boys. Okay, um, he's not the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. He's, uh, he was a, a, an English canal builder engineer who liked to collect fossils. And what he realized uh, is wherever he went in England to dig ditches and canals is that he could actually predict the um, different fossil organisms that he'd find as you dig deeper and deeper. Even despite the fact that maybe the rock units would change, he could tell you uh, and in which sequence you find different fossils. And so what he realized was he was really um, digging through geologic time and going through the ages of different organisms that dominated uh, the earth during that geologic time. So there was the age of trilobites, so the sedimentary rocks that contained uh, fossils were uh, had trilobites in abundance. Then later on, as trilobites went extinct, then uh, you see you see more fish fossils. And then um, as <clears throat> um, organisms changed and evolved on Earth, then the next succession of organisms would be the age of reptiles, and then the age of mammals much later on. Okay, and so the idea is that organisms exist kind of like in a one-way time vector. They exist, they go through geologic time, and then they go extinct and they die, right? And then the next organism evolves, comes up, lives, and then goes extinct. And these organisms never come back, okay? So that uh, each um, kind of wave of new organisms represents uh, a succession of organisms that existed during uh, Earth's history. And if you find these organisms, then you can kind of use it as a time marker to go back to this time in geologic history. Okay, uh, particularly useful fossils are index fossils. These are organisms that are kind of widespread geographically, but limited to a very short period of time. So they like, they showed up on earth and then they went extinct, a very small window in time. So it's kind of like a book marker in that kind of uh, book of geologic history. So if you ever go anywhere and you find this type of organism, which is an index fossil, it'll specifically point you to a, a time period in Earth's history. So they're, they're very useful, but they're not very common. So what, what scientists have to do is they have to come up with uh, fossil assemblages. And fossil assemblages are essentially groups of, uh, of, of organisms together with their uh, age, their span of how long they existed. And by using that information, you can kind of deduce uh, how long they, uh, uh, the, the age of the rock based on uh, the spans of time that they existed. Here, let me show you in the following image. Here's an, an SEM image of uh, an index fossil, Foraminifera, right here. Um, uh, there are thousands of species of Foraminifera that are found in ocean sediment, and if you find a specific species, it could bring you to a specific time period, maybe like the Miocene or something, okay? 
So uh, pa micro paleontologists would be super excited to find this species of, uh, of foraminifera because then they could go, oh, this sediment or this sedimentary rock is uh, in Miocene of age, yay. Okay, but this is what I mean by fossil assemblage. So let's say this is your rock unit, rock unit B, okay, and it contains these five fossils, okay, and those organisms, some of them existed from uh, this time interval, okay, so here's older and younger in the time interval, all right. Um, so wherever these organisms overlap, so here they overlap, you can deduce that this rock unit must have occurred during this overlap time. But the more fossils you have, you can kind of narrow it down. So here, this tree here only existed during this time period. Okay, so the only time that a trilobite and this tree could have ex existed together to become, you know, uh, to perish and become part of the fossil record would be during this smaller window in time. So therefore, you can deduce the age of the rock based on the fossils you find. Okay, in rock unit A, here is the T. rex fossil. This is when it existed in geologic time. But the, the time where you had T. rex organism, or the T. rex and this tree species exist together is during this n narrower window of time right here. And so that you can deduce that your rock age falls along this smaller area in geologic time. So that's why fossil assemblages are useful. Fossils are also useful because they're, they can indicate a number of things. One, they tell us about past environments. So, you know, ocean organisms, they live in specific environments and depths within the ocean. So if we find certain types of barnacles, for example, we know that they existed in certain depths. Um, corals, for example, they can tell us what um, ancient sea surface temperatures were like. Corals can only grow under certain latitudes and certain temperatures of the ocean. Um, so they can be what we refer to as like paleothermometers. So uh, the fossils are very important um, environmental indicators for that reason. All right, let's go over radioactivity. Radioactivity, this is kind of a review from your uh, high school chemistry class, but um, this was a, a real game changer in geology. Once we, once we realized that um, certain elements will decay at a constant rate, and then that we can use that to date uh, certain uh, geologic, geologic events in rock units. Um, that really was amazing to be able to put numerical dates on, on events. Uh, but essentially, <clears throat> uh, any atom will contain uh, protons and neutrons. Those are the nucleus. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons are meh, like just kind of neutrally charged, okay, but they both have mass, okay, that's important. They both weigh something. Um, uh, electrons are negatively charged and they orbit the nucleus, and the atomic number of a proton, uh, of, a, of an atom, is the number of protons in the nucleus, okay? So what happens in nature is that there is a lot of variation and variety amongst the different elements, meaning that, like, um, say you have uh, carbon, for example. Carbon has six neutrons, but there are other carbon atoms that may have more neutrons than six. And what that is is an isotope, okay? So you have the same number of protons, okay, but a different number of neutrons, and that leads to different atomic mass. And because of the differences in atomic mass, these isotopes can be fractionated in different um, uh, geologic processes. Okay, so what radioactivity is is just spontaneous decay of uh, certain elements, and it's typically really heavy elements that have a lot of neutrons in the nucleus. Once you start packing the nucleus with a bunch of subatomic particles, it becomes unstable, and when it's unstable, it'll undergo radioactivity, that's spontaneous decay. And there's three types. There's alpha emission, okay? That's when an alpha particle is emitted. So uh, two protons and two neutrons are ejected. It's a, a big chunk of the nucleus is just shot out. And along with this, a lot of uh, X-rays and gamma rays are, are released as well. So that's why they're, it's kind of dangerous to deal with radioactive elements. Um, there's also beta emission. 
This is when an electron is ejected from the atom. So here a neutron uh, becomes a proton, so the element changes. Okay, um, And then there's electron capture. So the nucleus actually captures an electron, and that changes a, a proton to a neutron. And so you get a decrease in the atomic number by one. So these are the three ways uh, elements can uh, radioactively decay. Okay, so the unstable radioactive uh, isotope, the unstable one, the one that is actively decaying, we call the parent because it's like the original one. Um, and then the, uh, the isotopes that are, are the result of that decay, we call them the daughters. Okay, and in nature, we can measure the ratio between the parent and the daughter. Okay, and that's what we use to determine the numerical age of uh, a mineral or a rock unit. Okay, so here are the examples. Here's alpha emission, four subatomic particles being shot out. Okay, or here's uh, beta emission and electron capture. All right, here's the decay chain for uranium-238. Uh, uranium-238 is radioactive and unstable, and it goes through like a 14-step process bunch of alpha emissions and beta emissions until it gets to its uh, stable um, daughter, lead 206. So it can be a pretty complex process. Okay, so what radiometric dating is, is uh, the science of being able to date typically igneous rocks and also um, igneous minerals and essentially measure the ratio of parent to daughter ratio and that helps us calculate the age of that rock or, or when that mineral crystallized. So when that igneous rock crystallized or when that mineral crystallized, okay? The half-life, uh, the half-life is the amount of time required for half of the radioactive isotope to decay. So if you have a parent and you have 100 atoms of that parent isotope, let's go here, you have 100 atoms of the, of the radioactive parent isotope, as it decays, its population is gonna decrease. And as it decays, the number of daughter isotopes is going to increase. And where they intersect and the ratio is one to one, if you started off with 100 parent isotopes and now you're left with 50, and then you have 50 daughter isotopes, that's one half-life. Um, and as this process continues, uh, half the parent isotopes decay again down to 25, that would be the second half-life, okay? And then we can calculate how long it takes for a half-life to occur, okay? So, for example, potassium argon, so potassium, okay, and argon, all right? That's a very commonly used um, isotopic system. Remember, because um, potassium feldspar is the most common uh, mineral in the Earth's crust, or, felt, or feldspar is, has a lot of potassium in it. So potassium... Uh, 40 will decay into argon 40, okay? That half-life occurs uh, every 1.3 billion years. So this gives us the opportunity to, to date rocks that are as young as 100,000 years old, and that's geologically pretty young, okay? And what happens is in that potassium feldspar, the potassium decays to argon 40, which is a gas, and it's trapped within that feldspar, and then we can actually measure that and then uh, comparing those, uh, the ratio between the daughter and the parent isotope allows us to calculate the age of that mineral, of that potassium feldspar. Okay, here are some other isotopic systems. There is uranium-238 and 235, okay? Um, the half-lives here are really long, okay? Um, rubidium strontium, thorium lead, potassium argon, as I talked about before. But um, there are a lot of different isotopic systems. There are a lot of radioactive um, parent isotopes, and then we can use them to compare the ages uh, of different rocks and then compare them to different isotopic systems. And that's how we've come up with the age of uh, different rock units and the age of the Earth, ultimately. So it's really, uh, some isotopic systems are complex. Like I said before, uranium-238 has 14 steps, which is pretty crazy. At one point, it decays into radon. Radon's a gas. Uh, it has a half-life half of, a, of a couple days, right? Um, that's why we have radon detectors in basements in the Northeast, because um, when uh, basements are pretty close to the bedrock, which is typically granite, and granite has a lot of uranium in it. So when uranium decays, um, you can have radon uh, accumulate in your basement uh, through cracks and stuff like that. So 
That's why we have to keep track of that. Okay, but there are sources of error. Um, <clears throat> if you have any loss of parent or uh, daughter isotopes, that'll throw off the ratio and give you an unreliable date. So what you have to have is really fresh, unweathered, uh, typically igneous rocks is, are the rocks that give you the best ages. Okay, so what does this mean? The Earth is really old. The Earth is uh, about 4.6 billion years old, and we know this because we've dated um, the meteorites that that have uh, crashed on Earth that were kind of former planetesimal material uh, that has la that have landed on Earth, and they all give us the same age, 4.6 billion years old. And then scientists went out and started dating uh, rocks that we found on the Earth's surface, and we found out that these rocks are also very old. On continents, we found rocks that are about 3.5 billion years old. We've also found rocks that are 3.8 billion years old. And this really confirmed the idea that geologic time is immense, and the Earth has been around for a really long time. A useful um, isotopic system is carbon-14, especially for archaeologists, because Carbon-14 is uh, or has a half-life of only 5,730 years, and that's used to date recent events, which is pretty cool. You can date um, like plant material, embers, uh, so it's particularly useful from the standpoint of understanding human history. Uh, we haven't been around that long, so we can we can look at events as young as 70,000 years. Okay, and carbon-14 is a cosmogenic nuclide. So it's created in the upper atmosphere by cosmic ray bombardment. So essentially what happens is nitrogen is bombarded by cosmic rays and then becomes carbon-14. And then that starts the process of uh, the, the decay of carbon-14 back into nitrogen. So you can do it, you can date organic matter through this, which is very useful. Okay, so when we see cave paintings where they use uh, ash from the embers of their fire, to draw, you know, like Pumba or something. Uh, we can date that, so that's pretty amazing. Okay, so ultimately, what this all led to, being able to uh, correlate rocks from different regions of the Earth via fossil assemblages and correlation, and then later being able to date individual units, geologi ge geologists across the world were able to uh, create a geologic time scale, and it and essentially just encompasses all of Earth's history and it subdivides it into very meaning, meaningful, uh, you know, uh, units of time. Okay, so originally they created it before numerical dating was possible, uh, but then later numerical dates was applied to it. Okay, so the way it's structured is an eon represents the greatest expanse of time. Okay, the past 540 million years has been the Phanerozoic eon, or the eon of visible life. All right, that's the most recent eon. This is when we've started to see fossils in the sedimentary rock record, okay? And within the Phanerozoic Eon, um, there are three eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. Paleozoic means ancient life, Meso meaning middle, and Ceno meaning recent. Okay, so here, um, this is the Phanerozoic, the past 540 uh, million years to today. So this would be today, this would be 540 million years ago. Before this, we refer to this time as the Precambrian, right? And then this is the beginning of Earth, 4.6 billion years. Okay, um, this is the time scale, uh, the geologic time scale to scale. Um, and then over here, um, we blow up the Phanerozoic to show you all the different uh, periods and epochs within the Phanerozoic. Okay, so each uh, era is divided into periods, okay? The Paleozoic has seven periods, all right, of the Mesozoic and uh, Cenozoic each have three, and then um, each period is divided into epochs. And each one of these um, divisions relates to some sort of geologic event, could be a major mass extinction, uh, could have been uh, shifts in climate, um, and that's, uh, that's how you divide those kind of different areas. All right, before the Phanerozoic, uh, is the Precambrian, and the Precambrian really is the majority of Earth time, okay? It's about 88% of Earth's history, and we know very little about the four billion years of, of that time because there are no, there are no you know, fossils. Uh, the rocks that uh, are from the Precambrian are very old and weathered. 
so we lose a lot of information. So we, we don't know much uh, going back that far in geologic time. Okay. Um, during the Precambrian, the organisms that existed, uh, single-celled bacteria, algae, that's what dominated. Um, one of the fossils I know that we found in the Precambrian are stromatolites, which are just uh, single-celled bacteria that photosynthesized in the ocean, in shallow parts of the ocean. So um, really not much from the Precambrian. Okay, but a, a very nice way of looking at the geologic time scale is in a circle, right? Um, if we start off with the uh, beginning of Earth, 4.6 billion years ago, okay, the formation of the moon shortly after that. Here, um, this is uh, when we found the very first fossils confirming photosynthesis, 3.5 billion years ago. That's when we find those stromatolites. Um, this began to change the composition of our atmosphere uh, for the better uh, because we didn't have free oxygen in the atmosphere. We didn't have an ozone layer, and that's really important for the evolution of um, kind of single-celled organisms to multicellular life. Okay, um, it took about um, about a billion and uh, about a billion years uh, of just single-celled bacteria in the ocean uh, and that photosynthesis to free up enough free oxygen in the atmosphere to create an ozone layer. Okay, and we have direct evidence of the atmosphere becoming oxygen-rich on Earth about 2.3 billion years ago. Um, we find them in banded iron formations. Um, but this indicates that oh, we started to develop kind of like our modern atmosphere with free oxygen and an ozone layer. And the ozone layer is important because it acts as a filter for UV radiation, and uh, that allowed for uh, single-celled organisms to be closer to the, the upper layers of the ocean, shallower areas, and allowed them to evolve. So we went from prokaryotes here in purple to eukaryotes, and that's our branch of life, more complex single-celled organisms. And then much later on, here's when multicellular organisms first showed up on Earth, about a billion and a half years ago. Um, animals started to show up on Earth approximately 600, 700 million years ago. Here's the beginning of the Paleozoic, 542. Vertebrate land animals showed up in the middle of the Paleozoic. All right. Mammals showed up in the Mesozoic, along with uh, the dinosaurs, we can all laugh about the dinosaurs, like, hey, they all went extinct, but they existed for about 180 million years of Earth time, right? And if, I don't know if you see that, but that's humans right there. We've been around for two million years, and we're struggling, right? Okay, so here's the geologic time scale again. This is uh, to scale, showing you how long the Precambrian really is. Here's the blow up of the Phanerozoic. And here's an easier, kind of smaller time scale of the, uh, kind of showing you all the different periods and epochs uh, during the uh, Phanerozoic. Okay. Um, and then lastly, really, um, sedimentary rocks can rarely be dated directly. Um, and that's because sedimentary rocks are made up of kind of broken up pieces of other rocks. Um, and so essentially what uh, earth scientists do or geologists do is they rely on igneous rocks. Igneous rocks really give you the reliable ages that we can uh, use. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is we bracket the rocks that surround them. Let me just show you here. So we can date minerals and fresh igneous rocks. Okay. So like uh, right here, this, uh, this volcanic ash bed, we can date this directly. Okay. So uh, using modern radiometric techniques, we've determined this is 160 million years old. Um, but these are sedimentary rocks right here, Somerville and the Morrison Formation. We can't determine their ages, their numerical ages directly. So all we say is that they're greater than 160 million years because um, they're underneath this ash bed, right? So the principle of superposition. Okay, and then here's an igneous dike that's dated at 66 million years. So these three formations that are above the volcanic ash bed, but are also cut through this igneous dike, um, we can say that they're younger than 160 million years, but they're older than 66, because 66 million years ago is when this dike cut through them. So essentially that's what bracketing means. So we bracketed these sedimentary rocks based on the igneous rocks that surround them. And so that's how we do it.